So good morning, welcome. My name is Dr. Nancy Miles, Part 4, Chimfi. This will be our last session online together whilst you wait to join the in-person mop-up tutorial, if you like, uh, revision session on Saturday and Sunday. Just pick a day and join. This is main campus, January 2024. So that, that this instruction goes to that group. The content proper do can be accessible and useful to all groups of critical thinking, past, present, and future. We are discussing informal fallacies. That is the last topic, and we want it to be as organized and simple to access as possible. So let me just show you first and foremost, look at your screens, please what we mean by informal fallacies. Why informal fallacies? Because we've met fallacies earlier. The word fallacy just simplified means error or mistake in the way we are reasoning. So when you commit a fallacy, it means you are reasoning erroneously. You are making an error. You are committing an error in the way you are reasoning. There's a mistake. There is something inappropriate about how you are reasoning, reasoning. So giving reason to support a claim, but you're not doing it well. So we, de we detect an error of a kind. That is what makes it a fallacy. Now, when we saw unit six, the valid patterns, we noticed that there are fallacies of the form in unit six. So we, we call them formal fallacies. That is what a fallacy arising from a deviation from the form, going contrary to what the form says. There is a form, a pattern, a structure of deduction, a pattern for validity that you have not obeyed. So those fallacies were called formal fallacies, meaning errors about the form of reason. Okay. And that's where we saw affirming the consequent, denying the antecedent, false hypothetical syllabus. You realize, therefore, that those fallacies, look on your screen, please, were purely logical mistakes. And so we described them as invalid ways of deducing. Validity has to do with deduction. Okay, so formal fallacies occurred when the, the person reasoning is trying to reason deductively, but doesn't do it well. In other words, goes contrary to the pattern, goes against the form. That's why we say that those are formal fallacies. Okay, But for informal fallacies, there isn't any logical pattern that the person has deviated from. No, the person has committed an error in the way they are reasoning, yes, but it is not an error of the form. You see that that is why they are informal in nature. Of course, some also think that an additional reason why we label such fallacies as informal is because they are committed in our informal discourses. But, but that is a bit tricky. The real reason is that there is a pattern of deduction. There is a form, a, a structure of deduction that has been uh, disobeyed or the person has erroneously overlooked. And that is what makes that one a formal fallacy. Informal ones are not so. So let me ask your colleague, Magdalene, to read informal fallacies. Magdalene, please read for us. Rooney, be on standby. Okay. Informal fallacy. Formal fallacy. Formal fallacy. Parties no, just read, just read. Sorry, my dear. There's, there's an ambiguity in my instruction. Just read the informal fallacies in red. Just that, and let's move on. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Informal fallacies. Errors and mistakes to do with the content of inductive arguments. Effective arguments that often are used rhetorical ploys. Very good. So for informal fallacies, we know what it is not. It is not a deviation from the form. But what is it? It is rather a defection or a defective pattern. Something is not properly done about 
the reasoning. So there is a defect. There is a, a defect means something didn't go right in how the person is reasoning. Okay. And sometimes it may have to do with what the rhetoric, the way the person is using language or other reasons. And so we'll look at what constitutes the various categorizations of informal fallacies. Sometimes when people commit such informal fallacies, the fallacies are the error you detect is as a result of what? The relevance you are querying the relevance of the evidence given to the conclusion draw. You are raising an objection. You say there is a fallacy of relevance. You are telling the speaker, the person who is committing that fallacy that, look, I see a problem with the way you are reasoning. And that problem has to do with how relevant the premise you want to offer me is to the conclusion you are drawing. In other words, indirectly, I'm telling you, your premises are not relevant to the conclusion you are drawing. That is a type of informal fallacy categorization grouping. You see that. At other times, when I, I call out an informal fallacy, I'm not talking about an error about the relevance of the premises to the conclusion, but rather I am showing that your premises are connected to the conclusion. Yes, that's fine, but it is not enough to do what you want it to do. Either it is so weak a premise that it cannot ground the conclusion. Remember, informal fallacies are occurring in induction and not in deduction. So suppose I have a few instances, and then based on that, I want to draw a generalization from those few instances. See, I are cheated and I, I just too cheated. Therefore, as for women, they are all cheats. If I argue that way, I may be generalizing in a haste. You see hasty generalization shortly, okay? So that would be a good example of a weak induction. That is where the premises are relevant to the conclusion, but they do not support the conclusion in the way intended. They don't do it the way, they don't have the strength to do the supporting of the conclusion. So there's a categorization of informal fallacies that fall under weak induction, okay? Then we will still have some informal fallacies. They, we call them a fallacy because those particular ones together fall under a manipulation of the language. You are playing on the language. You are manipulating. You are doing something about how you're using language to, to, to make, to convince me to accept the claim. You haven't really argued well. What you have done is to manipulate the language. And immediately, I want to just mention straightforward to you, secularity. Remember begging the question? Tautology, we saw it when we saw uh, problems with definitions. And the same thing happens here. Remember equivocation too. We saw it when we introduced ourselves to definitions, the connotations and denotations of a word. And immediately also when we saw ambiguity and vagueness, we saw equivocation and how when people are equivocal on the word free, for example, or on the word law, or on the word uh, man, I think I gave you the Zainab example, etc. It can suggest something from the way the person is arguing, oscillating from one meaning of the word to another without prompting. You see that? Without prompting that, that's what I've done. So it suggests a certain sense of uh, uh, argumentation that you haven't really done. Remember the free one. I don't understand why women are always complaining that they don't have the same freedoms like men. After all, Ghana is a free country and anyone is allowed to do what they like freely. These are about three different connotations of the word free, okay? All mixed up in the argument a person is preferring, making it look as if he has convinced us with solid grounds, but it was just equivocation. It's a manipulation of language. So you will see that secularity, equivocation, later on I'll explain pseudo position and others to you. They manipulate the language and watch, watch your screen. They also manipulate the data or the statistics. So where people use figures, mathematical figures, you know that when you see figures, then you, you, you have a certain sense of 
you, you, you presuppose a certain sense of precision, exactness, that sometimes doesn't exist. It is just a fallacy. The person presenting facts and figures may be committing fallacies. They will expose you to some possible fallacies around the mat uh, mathematical figures and statistical figures. Yeah. As soon as you hear 92.99% of so and so and so and so, sometimes you don't even look at what it is at the 92 point, whatever it's qualifying. You get scared and say, wow, it is really this thing we have to watch. And for all you know, what it is that the research is supposedly uh, qualifying, showing you that 92% point, whatever. It's a vague concept that is not even measurable. You can't even determine how to measure it. So how is it that someone or an institution says they've measured it and they've come to a certain exact, you know, precise, <laughs> determinate figure, like 98.996? Now, you are shocked. We will see that. That's something bordering on pseudo precision. So you see pseudo position, you see semi-attack figures, et cetera, et cetera. And they are all meant to tell us that you cannot allow yourself to be manipulated by the language or the statistics, and you shouldn't also do so. So these are all ways of grouping or categorizing informal fallacies. And for starters, we want you to know that there might be overlaps. Mm -hmm. There might be overlaps. So the fallacies of relevance, you can have a particular fallacy that may belong to a fallacy of relevance and at the same time may be manipulating data or manipulating language. Now let's give some, some uh, symbolisms to help you. So think of these categorizations as the way we categorize infections okay, or diseases. We can have a fungal infection, we can have a bacterial one, we can have a viral or one that emanates from viruses. Okay, these are three ways you can categorize an infection. But look at COVID-19. I, I know it to be a virus. HIV is also a virus, but HIV is not COVID-19. Yet we, we categorize them together. Okay. But HIV could also be an STD, which COVID-19 is not a sexually transmitted disease, and so on and so forth. So the, the categorizations are only meant to help you navigate around them. They are not uh, strictly uh, either for or against, no. Okay. Now, also take note that one fallacy, keep looking on my screen. I won't caution again because I'm teaching with the screen. If you get distracted, it, it will be your fault. Okay. I want you to be focused. We are finishing our lecture. So just note on my screen that one passage like this could be committing more than one fallacy. It can be multiply flawed. That's all that it means. Multiple, plenty flaws, plenty errors. So you are the science folks. Most of you are. One patient in cell and so on and so forth. One person boils, skin rashes. So when you're going to treat, you see that you give something for the blood, something for the jaundice, something to ensure that they are they have appetite to eat, something for the worms, maybe as a worm, a, a worm condition as well, infested with worms. The point I'm making is so you don't have to think that when you see one passage, it must necessarily be only one fallacy. There could be multiplicities of fallacies within one passage. Your ability to identify the parts of it that are committing which type of fallacy is a skill that you must develop. So we gave you some examples that you see the appeal to pity. This one has both appeal to pity and ad hominem. This one has two. This one, if there is time, I'll go through it with you. If not, you can just read through it and find it. The answers are already there. They have about three fallacies detected in this. Okay, so the conclusion after all is done is this. I want one of you to read for me. My lady, please read this one also. Then Rooney can take over the next weeks. Go ahead. Rooney, if she's not ready, please read for me. Thank you. 
Conclusion. A critical thinker will not be duped if armed with an awareness of the different ways that are to provide a motivation to believe a conclusion instead of being provided good logical reasons to believe that conclusion. To accept a claim on the basis of some irre irrelevant psychological inducements, fear, emotions, cultural beliefs, personal biases, linguistic and statistical manipulations is to fall short as a critical thinker. Well done, thank you very much. So the point is, by the time we go through the different types of fallacies, which I'm hoping that by now you would have seen them already, I just so want to hold classes, the live sessions. Okay, by the time we go through, you should know that people have to give you rational grounds, logical grounds. When we say logic, don't let it be too technical. Rational, there should be reasoning. Grounds, mm -hmm. aims have been made. Not to whip up your emotions, whether it is in church or politics or international relations or cultural matters or family management or dispute or at the law court. Look, <laughs> don't do emotions. Emotions could be fear, could be pity, could be uh, uh, anxiety, they don't wash. God said, uh, God, just to give you some perspective, God said, come, let us reason together. If your sins are as red as scarlet, after the reasoning, we will all come, to, we all know where we stand. Then I will help you make it white as snow. But before then, you let's do the reasoning together. So say your own, present your premise. Let me present mine. God did that with Abraham. Those who do the Bible, yeah, negotiated. So what if you go there, you get even 40 people who are good, will you still destroy them? Okay, well, if I go for them, that, that's good enough grounds. I don't have to. But till 10, negotiator. God didn't say, come, let us cry together. He doesn't have a handkerchief to give you to cry. <laughs> Reasoning is key. You have to allow people and demand respectfully, of course, but on grounds, you see, rational grounds. Let us contribute resources. Let us contribute resources to finish up our, our church school. You see that? So that our students, our church folks can go to the ICHS and what have you in this high school. Okay. So as much as you can give, this will be the offering basket, or you can send it to this Momo line, or you can see as if you're being tamed with your, you know, Ghana must go back full of money. We have all these outlets to reach. See, okay, it will be very much appreciated to help us give our SHS people a place to school or a pipe or water or this. Thank you very much. I finished. I'm making an appeal. I'm rationally making an appeal. Not, are you sitting down? You don't know that this is God's word. Do you know what could have happened to you this morning if you didn't give this? Oh, my brother, what you are doing? It's witchcraft, it's manipulation. And truth has to be told. Yes. <laughs> what if you step out right now and a car knocks you down? All the money you are piled up, what you are appealing to consequences. You are threatening. You are forced. I'm going to take you through all that. And I'm starting in the chat so that we'll be at peace. Then when I move to politics and everywhere, you, you understand that this woman didn't come. All the things she says is against politicians. No, no, no. They are people of faith of different versions of faith, no problem. So, so we start from there for you to be at, be at peace with yourself. Look, do not let emotions lead you. If you don't marry me, if you don't marry me, then you can't work at my father's company. If you don't marry me, well, then I'll kill myself. Go and die, sister, die early. Why? If you don't marry me, you can't work in my father's company. Really? That's threat. Kofi, if you have started, you have started the fallacies. That's how I teach. We are chatting. Before you know it, we are, we are done. So if you don't focus, focus, uh, you will see. I've started taking the fallacies one after the other. Now, okay. Kofi, if you don't finish sweeping the room before 8 o'clock, we'll see who will give you food this evening. This is mommy. 
to Kofi. Now, what that means is Kofi should sweep the room because if he doesn't sweep, he will not eat. That's the reason of it. And do you know what that means? Do you know what that means if you told Kofi that Kofi, if you don't bath, you are not eating this evening. It means if Kofi can buy food for himself that day because he went to push track or went to do some betting and got money, that's it. Bath him, ah, dear. Kofi will not bath. Because you haven't rationally engaged a person on why he should bath. Reasoning. That's the point I'm trying to drive at with all the long talk. Give people grounds. You are a manage a, a whatever, a business executive, the bank manager or something. There is a deadline to meet. Your secretary or your project lead has to help put together, you know, the the project so that you can go and present it. If oh yeah, madam sec secretary, can you get this thing done before twelve o'clock? It will really help us. To we, the, those who are going to present, to be able to also organize ourselves so we can hit this bit and get a positive investment into the company. Okay, so can we do 12 together? What do you say to that? You know, you are giving grounds, you're encouraging the person, you are still letting them see the seriousness of finishing on time, but you're not threatening. Compare that to look, lady, finish typing those letters before 12 o'clock, otherwise, consider yourself fired. Hmm? Then you walk into your office. That's appeal to threats. Offer. You are threatening the president. God doesn't threaten us. <laughs> so there is a fallacy that diverts attention. It's evident. The supposed premises that are being offered eh, are diversionary. They are irrelevant. I'm referencing the first type of categorization. Okay, that is what I'm referring to fallacies of relevance. They also called fallacies that change the subject. One of them is what we are doing. Instead of giving me a reason why I should finish typing the letters at so-and-so time, reasons, grounds, evidence, premises, the person is threatening me. It's a threat. It's also called appeal to consequences, appeal to force, scare tactics, argumentum ad baculum. Marry me, otherwise I'll kill myself. Oh, sir, I told you that already. The reason why I should marry you is because you will kill yourself. You see that the child, uh, see the child, the lady doesn't have any, they doesn't love you, but because of the person's so called psychological trauma that he or she will go to. So the lady is just enduring you. Do you know what that means? You don't threaten. So I want us to take note of that. We don't threaten and we shouldn't let others threaten us. You can argue to show the consequences without using the consequences as a threat. Look, this bridge is what helps uh, this part of the nation or this part of the village to transport our cocoa, our uh, farm produce to the other town, all the way to Accra. Exports to help the nation. The bridge is broken. We have tried all the governments that have come in the past since Kwame Nkrumah. They haven't done it. You are the one coming. This is, let's say, an opinion leader imploring a politician. This is an election year who has come there. You are the next in line. We will, we will really employ you respectfully to attend to this for the reasons that we have offered. This bridge serves all these purposes. Without it, we are cut out of the nation. We have to go and go through the other towns before we can come. Uh, we can even make a speech at all. So, Mr. President, to be or Mr. Candidate, Mr. Flagbera, please put this on your priority list and save us. Full stop. I have argued. But imagine I said, every day people are coming here and going. This bridge has been here since Kwame Kuma. If you don't do this bid for us before so and so, we too, we are not voting for you. That is appeal to threats. You are threatening. You don't have reasons. That is why if you get someone who is logical, a little, academically inclined, the person might throw you off and say, well, so what? 
And we had that in recent times. <laughs> I had it in the news some of people apparently claiming that the president had thrown the bluff of some group or a, a society or community, yeah. That, well, yes, yeah, so if you won't go through it, because you don't threaten. You see, when you threaten, you let the, the, <laughs> the quote and unquote animal in the person come out. You can rationally ground your claims. You see how much time I've spent on that? From politics to church, to social issues, to marital, because it is often subtle, subtle, implicit, hidden, quiet, but the person is threatening. You don't want to. Let's have two reads on that and then we can trot. So this is one of the fallacies of relevance. The premises, the supposed premises of it are not relevant to the conclusion. You want your bridge done. What is the reason? Because if you don't, we will not vote for you. What is, I will not vote for you and bridge. It's diversionary. It's threatened. You are drawing my attention to the consequences of not doing this info. You're not really telling me why there is grounds for me to do it. That's the challenge, okay? And so, Sister Adwa Mensa, please read uh, the examples I'm projecting. So we, we can do just one or two. Let's use Johnny. Example three. Okay. Good morning, dog. Good morning, my lady. Go ahead. I have projected it too. As example, example, three. example, mm. example three. Johnny, of course, I deserve the use of your bicycle for the afternoon. After all, I'm sure you, you wouldn't want your mother to find out that you beat your little sister today. Very, today. 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 <laughs> so that's why you can imagine. Johnny will give the bicycle, he didn't add his lunch. We'll give all to that stubborn friend of his because if the mommy is like mommy Nancy, don't beat her sister, her daughter. No, I'm in trouble. <laughs> so he, it is a threat. It's subtle. The person hasn't taken a stick to chase Johnny. No, he's not using a gun to. No, 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 no. It is in the language, diversionary. No reason given. It is what appeal to threat. It's a fallacy. It's an error in the way the person is reasoning. Okay, the second one I have indirectly giving you that. So you know appeal to threats, you know the various names you can give to it, you know its Latin expression, argumentum at baculum. Now let's do uh, another fallacy that appeals to, so you see that all the fallacies that appeal to something, appeal to something are fallacies of relevance, meaning that they divert your attention from the issue being discussed to something else. That's why we say there are fallacies that change the subject. If you look at the textbook reference, that's how it puts it. Fallacies that change the subject or fallacies of relevance. They are diversionary. They are irrelevant to the conclusion. The second one is appeal to pity. Why do you think you qualify for this job? Uh, whose name is on the screen? So if you ask Sewa, if you ask Sewa, welcome to this panel. Says thank you. Why do you think you qualify for this job? You want to be a marketer in a company? Yes. Why did you see the advertisement? Say blah, 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 blah. You saw the money we want to give you, say yes. Why do you think you should be picked from the, all the people that are outside there? Yeah. Well, coming for the chance to qualify. If you ask please, I think you should give me the job because I've really suffered in this world. I suffered uh, right now. When I was coming, I didn't eat. I worked from Kaswa. My mother is sick. Sincerely, I have been looking for a job. Hey, if ya. If ya, Sewa. Is that your reason for... You know that people do that? First class student, brilliant. Go for interview. Invoking pity. You don't do that. You don't. You should give reasons why we should give you the job. I have gone through different experiences in life that have equipped me with the skill of managing personalities of all, all time. Give me this job. Give me a target. Give me three months. Watch me show you what I have. Even in the QE, I'm the only lady. That should tell you that I am a go-getter. 
I just left a sick mom at home. And she's doing fine because I'm confident that her competence is that will end with this job to take care of her. You see what I'm doing? Yeah, I'm arguing. I'm, they are factually verifiable claims. The other one that I said was invoking people. The person is trying to make you have mercy on them. The sister has gone to pour acid on someone. I'm, I just left the corporate office. I'm going on to the law court to give you practical reasoning, practice, contextualized representation of the ideas. So it will be meaningful to you. That's what I'm doing. You have gone to pour acid on someone's daughter at the law court. Now the judge wants to pass uh, a judgment. You are a woman. You pour the acid on the girl because you say you suspect or you have good reason to believe that the girl is that type of extra. It is even true. You have gone to pour the acid. Now, then the woman who has poured that seed on someone. Doctor, please, we can't hear you. All right. I hope you can hear me now. Yes, yes, doctor. Yes, please. What like that? We can so that uh, lady, lady Penis will be on your able to if she's out, she'll just fill in. Then we work that because we understand what is going on. Let's mop up nicely. I don't want to give myself an excuse not to hold a class. Anka, I don't have to. Then I tell you go and listen to a recording or something. But I don't want to do that. So we'll cooperate like that and cover up nicely. I was just saying that. So you are now telling. I will share this slide. You are now telling the judge that I'm a woman like you, or you are a judge. You're a woman. You have children. So the sentence you are going to pass. You see that is appealing. <laughs> That's appealing to pity. You are invoking pity in the person, so she can't be objective about. It. The decision she's going to make, but you went to pour acid on someone else's daughter who is a woman like you. Do you remember that? There's another funny appeal to pity example given, where the the orphan, the, the the boy apparently killed both of his parents, and then he, he's sentenced to whatever life imprisonment or so. And he says, "Please have mercy on me. I'm just an orphan." You see that? <laughs> who made you an orphan? Kill both of your parents, and now you're using that as a trump card to ask for mercy because you are an orphan. That's appeal to pity, and so on and so forth. So, what is appeal to pity? We have a good example in the slides. Please keep your hand up if you want to read. Okay, I see only Adua and Rooney. I think we have a bigger class, so we can have alternative reads. So, raise your hand and keep your hand up. Barbara, you can read this one for me. Love you, i be on standby. Okay, I'm going to project. Uh -huh. Please read example one. I deserve a man and F for UGRC 150. Look, my parents just got a divorce. If they see that I got an F, they will just blame each other. The fighting will start all over again, and I will be very sad. And I'll be very sad. Thank you. Because of... <laughs> Sometimes when I read some of the examples, I can't, I can't stand it, but if, if you don't change my grade, my parents will fight, dog. And I'll be very sad. So please change Emotions, they don't work. I told you, they don't work. Not that, not that people are not conscious of the emotional stuff. They are there. But you have to 
go beyond that and give reasons. That one moves and, and it is more mature and it yields better effect. Imagine, as I was telling, uh, I think uh, one of the groups, imagine a, a vice chancellor, she's a female, doing brilliantly well for the university, at least as I see it. I know many also see that. Imagine we had, we, 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 we should have, uh, uh, every way there's a challenge, something has happened, God forbid that. And I don't want to use any example, but imagine we have an unfortunate situation on Legon campus, uh, something bad may have happened and we need help from the general population. Look at these two scenarios. Then the vice chancellor puts the camera in front of her and say, Ghanaians, please. <laughs> We really need it. <laughs> Please try and invest your Ghana. <laughs> if you break down a reply, it's not a problem. But compare that to if I said, and the vice I said, ladies and gentlemen, good morning or good afternoon, wherever. It's unfortunate, invest your Ghana has to confront a difficulty like this. We are standing shoulder high to navigate this we will come out of it we just want to implore the whole world internationally ghana as a nation africa to stand with us because the university of ghana has contributed its bit to research to learning to academia and this is the time that the world should stand with us Positively, we are counting on you. Thank you very much. Three minutes. She's done. Compare this one with the one that why is it that nobody wants to come and help us? When will somebody bring us something? Which one will move a corporate entity to come with resources? I'm I'm just giving a scenario. God forbid it. Eh? Maybe the the BAM library or something got bent down. If you the second one can can move even aid from international bodies. It is, it is strong. It's, you are reasoning with the people. Look at how many people we churned out and what they've done to impact the world. Now that institution needs your support so that we can continue doing what we are doing. Because the University of Ghana is standing. We need people to stand with us. That's what it, 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 it's a huge strength. There's a weakness, but it is presented and argued for to show strength that you will feel that Charlie, I must be part of this worthwhile thing. That one attracts the help. I'm talking about where there is a need and then the person wants to present it in a pitiful, mobrowa, let's say, you know, kind of way and think that that is what will yield result. No, nobody wants to associate with people who are down, down there like that. So if it comes out that way, it has huge strength. And that's why appealing to pity is not good. It makes people emotional. They don't think. Okay, if you got that, then you will see why such, such reasoning are called out. They are coming to tell the lecturer that you deserve, look at the language, you deserve a better grade. Desert, you know, desert to deserve something, <laughs> a better mark than this. What are your reasons that you say because <laughs> you know, if he doesn't change the grade for you, which you deserve? Your <laughs> father and mother will fight uh, and you will be sad. Hey, you have a father and mother who, is, who fight. Some don't even have some. Yes. They are coming to school. You see that? So I hope that we got it. People play on it a lot. So we are done with appeal to pity. You know, appeal to force, appeal to pity. They are all fallacies of relevance. Let's move to appeal to the people. I'm sure you know this. Madam, please put a pony on my forehead. I ask you why. You say, oh, because that is what all Lego and girls are doing. But did you, did you check the size of your own forehead? I said that from lecture one. If you are playing my recording, you hear it all over the place. I keep repeating that. Check the size of your own forehead that you want a pony on top. And when we ask you, you say, that's what everyone is doing. A lot of people say this. A lot of people are doing That's why I want my wedding that way. That's what is in vogue. How much do you earn? Yeah, yeah. The guy's salary is 365 CDs, 20 pesos. Yours is 214 Ghana Do you know why? Because when you take out your 
TNT and the others. What is left is your salary. You buy data every day, you buy gobe when you go to work. And the work pays you 1,600 or something. The transport is 700 cities. Check it at the end of the month. And you buy food every day. So what really is left eh, <laughs> is that 266 Ghana. You want a, a buffet, not because you have what it takes to do it, but because that is what everyone is doing. That's the problem. The reasoning behind it is sick. It's directional. We ask you, why are you running towards this? Everybody's running towards this. We are all running. Which we see, they start running, so we run, run, run. We are all going this way. So then somebody points and says, why are we, why are we running? And the other, uh, well, we try. So all the people run, that's why I'm running. Oh, what? <laughs> Sometimes society is like that. The fact that plenty of people are following something does not in itself make that thing right or wrong. There has to be something about that thing that the plenty of people are following, you see? And that is what should be your argument line. So it might be that the product is durable. The product has multiple ways of charging it. If it is a charger or a phone or something, it, it, its parts are easy to find. If you were buying a car, you could say the reason why I want to buy this car is because of X, Y, Z. And you give the reasons. Don't say, oh, but can't you see walking down? Everybody is driving that one. That is diversionary. We don't care how many people are driving. Look, we are going to do Eastern as we God will. Crucify him, crucify him. Do you know how plenty of people say crucify him? And they crucify the son of glory. Yes. How many people say, Chobe, 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 for a certain political party? Four years after, the plenty of people's decision is no longer correct. <laughs> so you have to understand that the fact that plenty of people support something doesn't in itself make it right or wrong. You're a critical thinker. Interrogate what it is that is driving plenty of people and then make that one the reason you offer. Do you understand? Uh -huh. And that will buy. Uh, bounty at the market. So there are examples there, but I don't think these are difficult, so we can move on. Look at the various names given to it. Argumentum ad populum, grand, grand standard, bandwagon, appeal to the masses, appeal to consensus. It's Latin expression, I said it earlier, argumentum ad populum, popular, popularity, argument from popularity. Okay. Now, let's look at ad hominem from the word homo sapien, man. So the argument of the person, the argument that attacks the person. And when we say attacks, don't think you go and take a stick and hit someone, no. When you leave the issue being discussed and you start talking about the persons that are doing the discussion, we have something to talk about. Give me reasons why I should accept or reject a claim. Then you leave the reason of the issue, and you start talking about the person. So the talk may be a positive talk about the person, for which reason you think we should accept. It is still ad hominem. Or the talk may be a negative thing about the person, for which reason you say, don't accept. You see that? So when you leave the issue and you discuss the person, you commit ad hominem fallacy. I gave the example in that recording that I added to your thing, at the resource tool. When you go to the resource tool, you have all the recordings from lecture one to the end. You can play them to fill in the gaps that you may have. Suppose, so back to my screen, suppose um, Harriet and Esther, they are names I see on my screen. Eh? I'm just using you for teaching and learning. So suppose Harriet and Esther are part of the class. We are in a physical lecture hall. And then Harriet raises her hand and says, look, please, can we, I just want to suggest if we can open the windows and then switch off the, the fans brother, or something, because I think the place is a bit congested and I hear one or two people coughing. We know that these are not good times and I'm allergic to some stuff. So if colleagues will agree, then we should just open and get ventilation rather instead of the fan. Okay, that's Harriet's argument. The reason she offered for what she wants and she's in pleading with the class to see reason with her. Then Esther says, I don't think so, though. I disagree with Harriet. So we all want to find out why. The discussion is about opening the window for fresh air or keeping it as it is. Simplicity, that is the issue. Reasons have been offered. 
you disagree. Let's hear why you disagree. Then let's let's hear Esther. Esther says, "Hi, Etna. I don't know because she has a car, and she alone got a, a gigit, whatever before coming, and her father is so and so. When we come to class, she always wants to be seen. Oh." <laughs> This one is a serious problem. What is your problem? Do you see what is happening? We are discussing opening or closing window for fresh air. Your contribution, are you say the sister's father is this, she has bands, and then every day she changes her phone and this. Therefore, we shouldn't listen to her about the window, whether we should open it or that is at home. It's called attacking the person. You have left the issue. Your focus now is the person. Hey, love you, Anna Barbara. You are laughing. <laughs> that is problematic. And this type of ad hominem is the one we call the this logistic one. Look at your screen. This logistic. So my the two ladies will read so that <clears throat> so that you see that this logistic one says, don't accept what the person is saying and. The reason is because of some negative detracting things about the person. It leaves the issue and starts discussing the person, you see. Then we all go to, I, I heard some in the news then, back then, when Nanadu, our current president, the first gentleman of the land, was vying for president. Someone said, oh, but he cannot be. And the person was not a, 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 a low, 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 low person. The person was high there. I was shocked. I just took it that maybe it's one of the, Things people say in joke, I say joke, but you don't do that. And it doesn't matter whether you are whichever color of the party. It is the, the logic behind it that I'm querying. He cannot be president, said the person. Then the panelist also, somebody, you know, the wife, said, oh, but he's too short. Because he's too short. Really? That's how you reason. Height. Even height is always relative to some height, so cannot be present. It's very ad hominem. This logistic. Then the geologistic from the word to geologize. To geologize, to praise. So look at the definitions on your screen. Some suppose when Esther raised her hand that, oh, I want I have a comment, uh, a reaction to what Harriet said. So we all tell you, so I agree with Harriet. <laughs> So we want to say, oh, really, why? Why do I agree? say, oh, you know, Harriet is a giver. Harriet, yesterday, because she brought your love to class. She didn't even get some. Before she opened her eyes, we have, we have all the things. The phone I'm using right now is Harriet who gave it to me. If we come to class and we need a marker, <laughs> it is Harriet's bag that we get it from. Oh, bra, hey, say bra, hey, oh, it's that. Sister, eh, sister, this is training there to not help you. <laughs> that is totally diversionary. That's the point we are making. It is still called attacking the person. It's ad hominem. But this one is the eulogistic one. You are eulogizing the person to distract. Uh, what's that word? It's distractive. Eh? To distract our attention. Eh? To draw our attention away from the focus of our discussion. You don't do that. As a critical thing. And I think that the point is well made. So let's make Esther read one and then Harriet will read one for that. Esther, please, if you are there, read the first one for us at home in him, this logistic, the example there, and then Harriet will do at, at home in him, the logistic. Thank you. Yes, please. In I hope you are happy at me, Esther. <laughs> no, no, please. <laughs> yeah, okay, go ahead. <laughs> If the facts cited about the person associated with the conclusion are negative and detracting from the person's integrity or worthiness of confidence, then the fallacy is called this logistic ad hominem. Thank you very much. Harriet, read the, the other one. About the individual responsible for or associated with the conclusion, then the fallacy is called 
the logistic at home. Well done. Thank you very much. Let's I bring in the love to class. Bring mine as well so that me too, I can give you fans. Okay. Now, <laughs> those, two, <laughs> those two are two ways of presenting the ad hominem fallacy. Now, so if you don't know any fallacies at all yet, at least from our discussion, I'm intentionally going slowly because you won't have time to do another revision, any detailed revision, Biasa. So you have to get it very well from class. And then the, the mop up, when you look at the slides, it will only be to mop up, and to cement it in a little simmer. Remember, appeal to threats. We have done it. I gave you several examples. We've done appeal to the masses. Although there were plenty of people said something. BRCIS syndrome. We have done, <coughs> excuse me, uh, which other one? Appeal to pity. And then I just opted it up with uh, ad hominem. But you already know circularity and equivocation and genetic fallacy. You know them already. So I'll just walk you through them very quickly. And then we, we, we do the ones that are relatively technical. Look at appeal to unqualified authority. See the name, illegitimate appeal to authority or appeal to unqualified authority. The person is an authority, argumentum ad vericundian. He is an authority, but not in the field in question. That is the problem we have. See. The example we gave you there is example one. So maybe Solis can read that for me. If Solis's hand is still up. If not, I will take, um, let me take Lovia. Then Doreen will be on standby. Lovia, go ahead. Okay, example one. Our pastor appeal to authority. Example one. Our pastor says that prayer in public schools is not unconstitutional. Therefore, we must conclude that such prayer is perfectly legal. Our problem is that our pastor is a luminary, an authority, but not in legal matters. That law there is an expertise thing. There's another authority that speaks to that. Unless your pastor was a lawyer, then you are appealing to the lawyer in him, and then it will not be a fallacy. Okay. And then look at the title. You see appeal to authority. The original, look at the original. It should be this. Appeal to unqualified authority. That is what we are calling out. Or if you want to say it differently, then you say illegitimate appeal to authority. So you are appealing to an authority, but you are doing so in an illegitimate way, in a wrong way. That is what makes it an unqualified authority. Okay. Don't, don't forget. I think that uh, this was just a, a build up. So my colleague was just building it up. And so he just put appeal to authority. But it's, the fallacy is not called appeal to authority. It is called appeal to unqualified authority. That is what we are pointing out. So here, the example two, Professor Ebenezer Odro, the former vice chancellor before our current <coughs> Prof. Amfu took over. He was a vice chancellor then. And a professor, what, of entomology, the studying of insects, that's where his expertise is. If you tell us, therefore, that you think we should listen, that we should treat coronavirus with chloroquine, and we ask you, what is your reason for saying that? I say, oh, even the professor said to Professor A. Odru, hey, Professor Odru, now, as soon as we hear Professor Odru, if you are not careful, you will call us work it might and accept it. But his professorship and expertise, and the fact that he's, he's a boss in many ways, doesn't include coronavirus expertise. Not a chemist. Do you see that? So you are appealing to an authority, yes, but the authority is an unqualified one for the purpose. That is what we call her as fallacious. People sometimes, I, I don't teach theater arts. I don't know anything about theater arts. I may be an expert in a field, but if you go and put me in another field to go and speak authoritatively on that, you will be committing <laughs> to appeal to what I have said concerning that discipline as a, a grounds for accepting or rejecting, then you are committing that. Very straightforward, you see that. Okay, then we have hasty generalization. Look at your screen, please, everyone. From two instances or three, a few, I should say, instances, you draw a conclusion about the whole 
I think that that why you can easily do it. Let's get, I asked someone to be on standby to read for me. So please read. Uh -huh. Let me take another one so that we can laugh a little. Example three. <laughs> Please, I asked you, I think it was Doreen. So Doreen, please read example three on hasty generalization for us. You are in a hurry to generalize. You are in a haste. You are in a haste to generalize. Go ahead. On our first date, Richie had his hands all over me, and I found it nearly impossible to keep him in his place. A week ago, John gave me that stupid line about how, in order to prove my love, I had to spend the night with him. Men are all alike. Or any of them want, or any of them want is sex. Thank you very much. It is the, the history generalization is committed at men are all alike. Sana men being in heart, <laughs> Listen, from two scenarios, you are concluding about all men. And that is the problem. You are in a haste to generalize. Love you. <laughs> it's only the being alone to bully that I know in every I've asked my other friends to give me some few lines. Eh? That's all they are showing me. Meals in Kwa, but I'll, I'll, I'll work it out. Don't worry. The next time I come, yeah, they are teaching me the insults. I don't want to say those. Uh, I will conclude and tell you. Listen, you are in a hurry to generalize. So here, you see that this is this type of fallacy is not, you won't think of this as a fallacy of relevance, the fallacies that change the subject. You see, this is not one of them. Look at it very well. This will be a fallacy of weak induction. What you want the evidence to do is not enough. The, the evidence is not able to do it. It is weak. It can't hold the conclusion you are drawing. What's the conclusion? Men are dear. Son of one tier. Men are how alike. What is your evidence? You are talking about what Richie did the last time and what John also did last week. And from these two people's experience, the experience you had with them, <laughs> you see, men, there. That's how they are. That is the problem. I think that we don't have to belabor the point. So, if we look at example one, yesterday, two students were diagnosed as contracting the coronavirus. Two, yesterday, today, two, two had the same diagnosis. Look at the person's conclusion. It is obvious we have an epidemic. Everyone on campus has corrupted. <laughs> From these two, do you know the number of students you have on campus? <laughs> Tens of thousands. Yes, in fact, if you include the distance and what have you, there is even more. Then you, you say you have seen two earlier, yesterday to another two. So everywhere, campus, they say, no, this is a baby. That's how some of the research work. Some, they said, are done. So when they make projections, it feels flat. How can you say someone is in a comfortable lead? When a person is trailing by one million votes, eh, nobody should give me that line about maybe it was stolen or what. Everything they be a bad or if student, you give them, they will, maybe it was stolen. Maybe they reduce. No. What was the difference? One million plus votes. What kind of research told the fine gentleman that you are in a comfortable lead? No, you didn't say, oh, we are, we are. We have an edge over them. Was no comfortable. They come and start interview two people, three people. Then you conclude and say, "Lego students have that. Be careful. You may be concluding in a haste. You you can take the whole nation or the whole church that sent you to go and explore. Come and tell us the prospect of hosting a crusade in that area. You come and give us wrong information." And say Holy Ghost didn't work. When it was you, take it to politics. The same thing. So you want to make sure you have a sample size that is representative enough, complete, relevant to the conclusion, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But more importantly, the size should be relevant enough. It should be sufficient enough. Don't go and do a hasty generalization. Now you get the print. Okay. So it is a fallacy of weak induction. 
a, a senior brother of hasty generalization is another fallacy called misplaced vividness. This is a little technical. Okay. So I want you to give me rapt attention so that you don't get yourself all worked up. It is not too straightforward like that. Appeal to this, appeal to that. So watch. It is just like hasty generalization. So we, the first problem we see with it is that it has insufficient evidence. You are moving from few instances to draw a conclusion about a whole. Okay, so it is like in a uh, hasty generalization. However, there is something else about misplaced vividness that distinguishes it from hasty generalization. I want one of you to read now and I'll build on it. So let me take uh, Sarah, Sarah Kreku. After what, oh, Solis, you're back. I called you earlier. After what, Solis can read. Sarah, go ahead. Please read clearly, okay? Let me help you. You are muted, oh, my dear. Sarah Kreku. Okay, Solis, if you are able to then unmute and read, maybe she's still organizing herself. Oh, stay with your gadget, please, everyone. Gabriel, can you read? What is happening? What is happening? What is happening? <laughs> when an emotional impact. No, it's fine. Don't worry. I think that uh, my sister has a technical. Who has a very clear? Rooney read very fine, but I just I don't want him alone to read. Okay, it's fine. Let's Rooney read. Rooney, are you able to read for me, Rooney Otoka? Yes, please. Yes, please. Okay, go ahead. Because when you read, it was very clear. Everyone, let's bear with ourselves. Sir. Rooney can do that for us. Go ahead, sir. Misplaced vividness. Misplaced vividness. When an emotional impact causes a person to jump to a conclusion or hastily generalize from experience, a small number of dramatic and vivid events are taken to outweigh a significant amount of statistical evidence. It deflects attention by focusing too much on a particularly vivid and provocative case. Excellent. You read like BBC, my brother. <laughs> anyway. Now, everyone watch. This is also like generalizing in a hasty, hasty generalization. Eh? But the generalization from the small instances to the whole set, that generalization occurs as a result of an emotional impact. Oftentimes, an unpleasant something that happened with that small case which is making you overly emphasize it to the point of generalizing, you see that? So it, the, the emotional impact around it, the emotion may be uh, positive or negative. Either you were extremely excited about it or you were extremely saddened about it. Then because of that, you draw a conclusion that overly generalizes because you don't have enough sufficient evidence to do so. That is that is it. So look at the third point here of your colleague Greg. It deflects attention by focusing too much. They focus too much on a particular vivid and provocative case. So one particular case, that's why it's a misplaced vividness, misplaced emphasis. You overly dramatize that one instance or two, those few instances, and then make it look as if it's so wild a case. Let's let's read the RLG1. So uh, this is Jane and Bill having a conversation. Jane wanting to buy a new laptop and Bill saying, which one do you want to get? And then Jane says, oh, I've done some few reading around, a few reading around. And I think that uh, RLG comes out as one of the options that the consumer magazines project. They say it's good. Then Bill says, Look at where the misplaced vividness comes in. So let's watch what Bill says. Rooney, please help me again with this. Okay. Let's get it technical. So I don't want us to have hiccups with the reading. Go ahead. Yes, please. I would guess the RLG laptop. A friend of mine bought one a month ago to finish his master's thesis. 
He was halfway through it when smoke started pouring out of the CPU. He didn't get the thesis done on time and he lost his financial aid. Now, he's selling bofo on the street. <laughs> hey. hey, I guess that won't go for the RELG line. <laughs> you see, uh, Bill is a concern man. Hey, bad Bill. Then she says that Bill also. The Bill, we don't know whether it's Bill the Bill. He said, I wouldn't go and get an RLG laptop. You want to go and buy an RLG? Hey, you haven't heard. Hmm. A friend of mine went to buy one now. When you switched it on, no, the smoke started coming out. He couldn't finish his PhD. I tell you, he, he lost his, his scholarship. Right now, he's even selling both food. <laughs> now, this is misplaced vividness, overly dramatizing, overly emphasizing to the point of blowing the conclusion out of uh, proportion. One instance of an RLG laptop that you claim your friend had a bad experience with, in cheap. You say because of that, right? Made the, now the, the graduate is selling. Uh, uh, bull fruit. Do you know bull fruit? Buffalo fair. Eh? <laughs> Is any bull fruit in town? Look at the consequences of ILG using IRL. That's what the person is trying to do. This is misplaced emphasis, misplaced vividness. So the evidence is insufficient. The person is overly dramatically playing on being vivid about a certain scenario to the point of making it cover every RLG that is. Look at the number of RLGs we are using. Hey, when the RLG people are doing admit for them, you should come and give me a fine RLG laptop. Should I use it to teach online? <laughs> this is appeal to, uh, this is not appeal to pity time, but this is appeal to reason. <laughs> the guy is being overly dramatic, eh? misplaced vividness. I don't think you will forget it now. So you will see that oftentimes, when you see misplaced vividness fallacy, it looks like hasty generalization. But then look at how the person is arguing from that instance, and you will see that he is blowing something out of proportion because of an emotional, oftentimes unpleasant scenario around that one instance. At another time, it is a pleasant one. We gave you one other example. When you go, you can check this one. It is a, supposedly a pleasant uh, 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 scenario, uh, a, ple a pleasant uh, case, but the person blows it out of proportion. So how many do we know now? We know secularity, we know equivocation, we know appeal to the masses, appeal to threats. I want you to be counting. You'll see how many you know. It's left with only two that you don't know very well. I'm going to help you see, okay. You know, uh, genetic fallacy, we saw it in cause and effect reasoning. Genetic fallacy, this is it, watch. You accept or reject because of the, the, the source. Hey, they have a problem. <laughs> this one, they, they brought it from so and so place, so they can't be, a, what if it has expired? What if the people mislabeled the drug? There is a thousand and one reason why you should interrogate the matter on its own merit or on the set laid out merit. Don't say it came from here. We it, it was so and so person who brought it into the root. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? I told you that. What would it cause an effect? That's so weak a mind. If you're critical thinker, don't be taken in by that. You are doing admissions or you are taking people into your outfits, employing them. They look at sometimes the or uh, the ethnicity of the person, and so this one is uh, this is so big. So just accepting or rejecting on the basis of the origin, the genesis, is what we are calling out here. It is not advisable. Hensley, do you want to read one or two examples of that for me, please? Uh, let's do the... Genetic fallacy, example one. 
the phone you are using was manufactured in China, so it must be a fake one. <laughs> Listen to a second. Hey, the China people, they are so bad. Yeah, they are fighting, so. So do the second one, let's go. <laughs> Example two. The new undergraduate system is a copy of the American university system. So it must be an improvement over what we had before. So this is a problem. I don't know if it was this group that I overly, you know, I, I used the, the, I showed the problem of the genetic fallacy in different applications from politics to cultural systems to even how we clothe at the colonial mentality. It's, it's very disheartening. So depending on which, course you are doing because this is a, a complex blend of student. Be minded. Just because something is sourced from somewhere doesn't in itself make it right or wrong. Is it functional? Do you need to tweak it a bit to suit our context? Politicians, and my political science students that may be here. <laughs> Would we want to perhaps interrogate the kind of democracy we want to run, which sits well with our cultural system? the way we do things. You see, if you go and borrow a big brother's trousers to wear, a big brother because the democracy of the West is not the same as it. Look at how old it is. So if your brother hands over something very quality, it's a fine, you know, expensive fabric-wise and everything, cloth for you or trouser, pants, eh? or, or fine apparel. We are not questioning the quality of the thing you give it to you, but does it function? Look at your size. It, there's no snow here. We don't have a systematized, if like transport system, hospital, this, that, that we are still growing. So that's the symbolism I'm, I'm using here. Look at your leg size. And look at your brother's shoe that he has brought to you, let's say from America or Canada or whatever, or Italy. The shoe's quality is not in contention. We haven't contested that. But we are saying, look at your own. Day. How do you run with this shoe? <laughs> you have to fill in with some foam, or if it is a dress, do some gathers here, cut this side, and it's still that dress, but cut at places and fine tuned to suit you. A word to the wise is enough. UK does, and I'm sure it will be this group, I think. Well, if it's not, then I'm telling you. It, it, there's a little kingdom. This parliament or prime minister, there's this all mixed together to create what they are calling a democracy there. And it is recognized worldwide as a world democracy. Do you see a king in America? No. Is it a democracy? Yes. So why is it that you and I, and I'm being a bit passionate about <laughs> Africa, but you are still having cool guitars, cool in 2023. Doesn't it tell you something? That we have to watch what we are taking in and what we are rejecting just because there, there goes what we are discussing, just because of its genesis. The be free by 90, where it is coming from. So we don't question it. We take hook, line, and sinker, carry it. Do the realism, you know, Kishri, <laughs> and carry that thing and bring it home. Yeah. And we will ask questions, we will tweak it a bit, we will check our practical, pragmatic conditioning and say that, well, this is fine, but because we are communal setting, we want to be careful with this majoritarian ballot box oriented 50 plus one kind of posture. It is very, very problematic. It will go. Doing a ballot, whatever, to bring a speaker into office. It is on the YouTube, so I'm not the one watching it. I'm <laughs> telling you now, side. Just to put a, people are chewing a shit, electric in parliament. The law makes. should tell you where you and we got. I've moved from I've moved from the parliament house. I'm going to family, and I'll show you. 
you don't go to that way and stand somewhere and say, I love you, you me love you, you love you, I love you. Okay, no, no. one witness, one witness. We are a married couple. You are joking. It's a joke. Mommy, daddy, yeah, this is my wife. Hi. <laughs> but I know to give you slaps. You don't go and say I I have married. This is me. How do you marry? Objectively, open mindedly, and pick what they can pick and reject what they can. But if you are genetically influenced like this. All you are looking at is where did it come from? This one, when you go to this place, they do it that way. And yet, as soon as you start reasoning that way, genetic fallacy. And then other times, you won't even give it consideration at all because it's coming from so and so place. This place has done this. Can anything good come from Nazareth? Genetic fallacy. Because a good thing can come from there. You say, well, this is Kumasi meat. This is the Kumasi one. Please, uh, don't you have it? You will be asked. You will be check it and see. You will Check the letter. She won't check how the guy stitched the thing together. He won't check anything. It came from Kumasi, finished. So he won't even consider it. Meanwhile, the other one that has the label that it came from so and so place, when you wear it two steps, three steps, it just removed. Because it wasn't made for here. Sometimes that's the reason. So if it is worn over there, it will not have any challenge. If it's a car tire, it won't have a challenge. But the ones that were made here, I'm not saying that everything made here is good. That's why I don't want you to use the genesis of it. Made here or made somewhere. The point is, check it on merits, not the source. Because the source may be faulty. All right. On that note, we move to the technical ones, which I will end with. So I want to pause and take a question before I do pseudo precision and semi-attached features. They are a little technical, but grace and experience will do it together. Let me take your questions if you have any. So I'll lower all the hands and then take, oh, is that thing? Okay. All hands are down now, please. So if you have a question and you raise your hand, I can see yours as a question and address it for you quickly. Question time on what we've done so far. Then I'll do pseudo precision and Lydia, go ahead to your question. Lydia, say. Lydia, I can't hear you, please. Is there any other question? If you also have a question, raise your hand, please, very quickly, so that this network thing that you can't trust now. OK. Lydia, unfortunately, I cannot hear you. I suspect others who can't hear you. But I'll give another opportunity to so write the question down. Okay, it might be a network challenge or something. Okay. Now, pseudo precision is also a fallacy. When do we say you are being pseudo precise? Pseudo means pretending to be. It is false. It's not genuine. Remember pseudo scientific statement in unit seven. Okay. Look at the various names we give to it. Over precision, false precision, misplaced precision, mathematical mystification. Please let me be sure if you can hear me. Can you hear me, please? Yes, yes. Sometimes, yo, yes. so mathematical mystification I using the mass to mystify us. Oh, the mass me bring me so. <laughs> you see that you are funny as with the mass. Now, so remember the various labels we have given to you because the names help you see what is happening there. It is a pretext, a pretending to be precise. That is the fallacy we are calling out. When we say pseudo precision, also called mathematical mystification, you are using figures, mathematical figures or statistics to pretend to be precise about something that when we as critical minds, you and I, we look at that thing you are qualifying with a mathematical figure, that thing cannot be precise. It is a vague concept, vagueness. You are 
Mm, it has landed here too. Yeah. The concept that you have put 10.993% to, to show us that you did a precise, exact, determinate work. Eh? They're trying to show us that you were very per, 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 exactly this and that, that, that. So you show us that it was 78.3992% of so and so. That so and so following is not a concept that can be precise. So how did you measure it to come and arrive at a supposed precise exact figure like this? It is a mystification. You are assigning us. <laughs> it is a pseudo precision. That is the whole point. And it is often because people are cowards. Silence with figures. As soon as you see figures, fundamentals and inflation, this and you know, look at the sense of importance that those who are dealing with figures sometimes have. As soon as you hear 72.99%, you yourself, you don't talk again. Say, oh, sir, mm -hmm. okay, yeah. then the percentage is very high. You are what it is that he's qualifying is vague. So, where that happens is what we call pseudo precision. We haven't said that whenever people are using uh, statistical figures or mathematical figures, then it means they are being the, uh, they are committing pseudo precision. No, it is when the figures are qualifying concepts that are not determinate, measurable in exact terms. Look on your screen, point two. Mm -hmm. When you can't even measure it, because of the nature of the concept we are dealing with. It is a vague concept. How did you measure it? <laughs> so even clear what it stands for. Example, look at that. So someone can read that and then I'll elaborate. Please, I lowered all the hands, so help me again. Raise your hand if you want to read. Uh, Magdalene, Magdalene, please read for me, okay? Divina, be on standby and love you, everyone, okay? Very quick, my yes, dear. So I do the yes, semi attack for you. Hmm. Pseudo precision. In a recent two year survey, 75.38% of students at the University of Ghana were discovered to be spiritually motivated. Please continue. Okay, let me just end the, uh, add the rest for you, okay? So we can confidently suppose that over three quarter of Legon students on campus today are spiritually motivated. Our problem is, what does it mean clearly to be what spiritually motivated? How do you measure spiritual motivation? <laughs> for you to come to the conclusion that you found out that 75.38%, hence, that is the problem. Oh. Spiritual motivation is no height, it's no weight. For you to go and measure and get such precision, go and lie to those who don't see through these things. But we, there, you and I, people, people listening to me, there, we can see something. We see through them. This one, you no know, go qualify for fact. Take your figures somewhere. It doesn't impress us. We are not cowards. Because motivation, spiritual motivation, what? Is it the dancing moves at the church auditorium? Or how many times the brother is hitting his forehead down to pray as a Muslim? What, what are you using to measure spiritual motivation? Or how many people are doing to point diabetes? Look, if you're looking at how the brother is dancing in the church auditorium, then you'll be deceived, though. It is because of the pastor's daughter. <laughs> I'm not having any target. But nah, nah, that is the target. You think he's heavily minded. <laughs> this is vague. That's the point we are. We are I'm showing you pseudo precision. All the examples are meant to help you have something you can relate to when you are trying to remember. Okay, that's all. And you see it to help you. So the person puts the figures there as a supposed research done, and it impresses people, and they say, oh, wow. Oh, we are confident about Lego and they are spiritual. How did you measure it? What is the determinant? And then you are concluding that about three quarters of Legon people are spiritually motivated, heavenly minded. This is a vague concept. So this is a pretending to be precise about something you cannot be precise about. 
pseudo precision, false precision. And the thing is emanating from what? The mystification with the mathematical figure. It is mass, then I would bring me in. So, okay, mass saying, say, when you are a crowd, they don't. You are using the mass to memorize us. On that note, pseudo precision, going, gone. The last one. Now, take note that pseudo precision was calling out a vagueness associated with the word the concept that you are trying to use a mathematical figure to qualify. Okay, so we are saying that the figure is not doing what you want it to do because that concept is not precise. So when you bring the figure there, you are just going to use the mathematical figure to pretend to be precise. That's pseudo precision, okay? Also called mathematical precision. But look at the other one, semi-attached figure. That one, again, there is a figure, mathematics or statistics are there. So it's a manipulation of the data. Pseudo precision is a manipulation of the language and the statistic. That's why we put them together. Now watch, for semi-attached figure, your premises may be true. The evidence you have in the premises, which contains the statistics, the figure, it may be very true. So we are not saying there is a, a vagueness there, the thing is not precise, and no, no, it's not that this one, you have evidence, a research, the figure, the 60.99% or the, uh, the statistic you have used there is empirically verifiable. So the premise is true. The figure in that premise is true. What you are stating in the premise, the premise is the evidence you want to give, it's true. But the truth of the premises, which contains the figure, hmm, the truth of that premise is irrelevant to the conclusion drawn. And Fahubia, it doesn't connect fully to the conclusion. It is not fully attached. You see, that's why it's semi attached, especially attached, attached to the premises. Yes, it's true. But you are going to use that premise, which has the figure, to support a certain conclusion. And we are sure. What is the connection between these premises, which have the figure, and we, we say, yes, that's true? But what is the connection? of the premises, the true premises, to this conclusion you are drawing, totally irrelevant. But because there are figures inside and the figures are attached to the premises and they are true as attached to the premises, okay? But not attached to the conclusion. That's why we say semi -at. I'm trying to help you see why the name. We say that that premise, that true premise, its truth is irrelevant to the conclusion. Why does it then suggest why is the person trying to use that to convince us? Because of the figures. When you see the 92.99 again, it impresses you. Then you don't interrogate anything. You accept the conclusion coming. You know, that conclusion is not connected to the premises at all. Let's look at some examples. Look at example one. If you want to sell your alcoholic drink as a cure for COVID-19, let's use a sanitizer. Okay. If you want to sell your sanitizer as a cure for COVID-19, but you can't actually prove that it works. Then simply publish your laboratory report, demonstrating that <laughs> half an ounce of your drink killed 99% of germs in a test tube in under seven seconds. Just show that your sanitizer, when you poured it into a test tube at the lab, it killed 99% germs at once. That is verifiable. So we can take that your uh, sanitizer and test it. If Food and Drug Authority folks come to your place, they can test it and they will see that, yes, your sanitizer, when we put it in the test, it killed 99% um, of the germs. Okay? So the evidence, the research, the data is accurate. But look at the conclusion that the person is going to use that to draw from the fact that 99% of germs were killed by her sanitizer. She concludes that therefore, you see, COVID is in trouble. <laughs> this, my sanitizer will squander, but only there, will smash COVID virus. Really? What did the data say? 99% of what? 
gems. What is the conclusion? It will kill COVID-19. So if you are not wearing your critical thinking cap, you go and buy that sanitizer like yours truly, myself, I did. 2020, when the COVID came ready, <laughs> when I entered the pharmacy, I'm looking at the, the inscriptions on the sanitizers. I see 99%, 99%. I say, I want this one, I want this one. I want I'll give all the four children one one, some in the car, some at my office, some even if I go at all to the office, some at home, at the fridge area, at the dining area. Charlie, go is 99%. So we are going to kill COVID. <laughs> Azuma is 99% killing gems. Gems. <laughs> but the conclusion of the advert is so it will kill COVID. As swivel, we have been swept, semi attached figure. The fact that the Sanitizer can kill 99% gems. It's true, true premise. Having 99%, that is what tricks us. The percentage, the statistic, the figure you see there in the premise inspires you. And the premise is also true. If you test it, you will see it's true. But look at the conclusion it is going to. So the thing doesn't have the warrant. That's why we say it's irrelevant. It's a diversion. It makes you think that, oh, it kills 99% gems. Oh, well, then, then, then it's, COVID is dead. Please bring it, bring it to my room and take it in. You go, COVID is standing there laughing because it is not a gem. <laughs> it's a virus. And this one is not included. And so if you get that drift, that is what the semi-attached figure does. Divina, please read the explanation given to semi-attached figure. Let's just cement it. One last example, and then we'll go home. Please go ahead. Love you, I'll be on standby. Divina, read for me very quickly, please. Semi-attached semi figure. A statistic or figure is attached to a conclusion, but it is irrelevant to the attributes featured in the conclusion or indirectly related to it. When the sample is not relevant to the hypothesis, the figures provided may just be partially related to the hypothesis. This is done to deflect attention from the subject matter and create the impression that the conclusion has been meticulously researched. Very good. Well, in fact, there hasn't been any such. My lady, you read well, so read the last example. So another, another example of semi-attached figure. I'll elaborate on that a bit and then we'll go home. Okay, example two. Ghanaian university students are more intelligent than Nigerian students. A research team from Boston College discovered that at Lagon, over the three-year period 2001 to 2004, 75% of enrolled students had A's in English language. But in Ibadan, over the same period, only 58% of the students had A's in English language. Well done. Hey, the way you read the more than a year, BBC. Now, my people, hmm, watch. Let me show you the semi-attached figure here. Again, the person is playing on figures, mathematics, seemingly presenting you with well-researched premises to ground a certain conclusion they are making. But look at it closely. The research says they, they, uh, they, 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 they discovered that what? Between 2001 and 2004, three years old, they're using it to represent the whole university's work. The University of Ghana is celebrated its 70th anniversary or so. Yeah, 70 or 75, I'm not <laughs> Last year. Listen, they used three years research to represent everything, but that is not even the headache. Watch. What did the research seek to do? To check how many got A in English language. So one group, one campus, that's UG, got 75% A's in English language, while the other invested there, but don't want the Nigerian one, got 58% in English. But look at the conclusion that the researcher came to. Ghanaian university students are more intelligent than watch than Nigerian students, not Nigerian university students, one. Two, not in English, so you, you did your research in English language. What about mathematics? 
in economics and other courses, science, politics. You go and do in English and you conclude that Ghanaian university students are more intelligent, intellect. <laughs> How can you conclude like that? <laughs> That's a, it's a problem. So if you look at the, the premise, oh, the premise looks fine. They did their research, yeah. Even Boston people came to help, yeah. What did they do? They saw that 75% uh, UG folks did well in what? English. It's English language. Then the Niger people did what? 58%. Don't let the 75 and 58 uh, blur your vision. What is the premise going to support? It is going to support a supposed claim. Look at the claim. The Ghanaian university students are more intelligent than Nigerian students. That is what you want to say. What is your evidence? That they, you did a, a research in English. And one got 75 and the other got it for a period of 2001 to 2004. Therefore, your conclusion is Ghanaian university students are more intelligent than Nigerian students, not Nigerian investing pool. The, this is a semi attached figure. Why? The figures you are using fully support the premises. Okay. But using that premise as a research work, meticulously done, that you are going to use to ground that. Claim the conclusion is what started at the university. It's wholly inadequate. It's totally irrelevant. Cry. English language, being brilliant in English language at 75% between 2001 and 2004. How does that then mean, therefore, that the University of Ghana students are more intelligent in all courses, in everything? <laughs> than Nigeria. That's why it's semi attack The research is not fully supportive of that conclusion. And the thing is arising from the use of figures, the supposed diversionary tactics that people use data, manipulated statistics to cause people to think that they have meticulously done some good job there. Which, as a critical mind, if you're on a panel, if you're on a project team, if you are part of that decision making body, those thinking through it, or those on the ground working, you have to call it out and help make that research better. And so I said this earlier look at the multiply flawed. We said it earlier, those who came in it, one, one uh, person can commit all three. Let's do this one together and go. Uh, Okay, Glennis, please read that for me, okay? The whole thing, then everyone can tell me how they, what they think of it, the fallacies they see there, and then we are done. Very good, everyone did well. Go ahead. Multiply flawed reasoning. I'm sorry, the word is multiply, uh, plenty, so multiply flawed. Go ahead. Muted. Lenny, you are muted. Okay, Rooney, finish it up for us. I think she's having a challenge. Rooney, please unmute and finish up for us. Thank you. Multiple flawed <laughs> reason. Mm -hmm. Honey, either you buy me you that buy five carat emerald ring, or I'll have nothing to wear on this awfully bare finger. You do want to make me happy, don't you? Wait, Give I'm me that see. ring, and I will <laughs> love you for life. Generalization. Are you ready? <laughs> Every good <laughs> husband. Yeah. Buys, yeah. <laughs> Every good husband buys their wife emerald rings. Look at my friend Akos. She's very happy now <laughs> that her husband bought her the ring. And so what too? She's, wives become unhappy because their husbands yeah. refuse to buy them emerald rings. Did we send you to go and say that for us? <laughs> I did. Thank you, my brother. Mm. Now, everyone, look at it. And let's see. Let's diagnose it together. Suppose you were given that and you are so assess the passage below, clearly identify any informal fallacy you see there. 
and why he says so. Normally we'll ask that so that we, we know which of the fathers. Which line is appealing to threat? Let me have a chorus answer. You have been very comported there. Let me have a chorus answer. Which lines or line do you think is appealing to threat? Okay. Don't worry, you're muted. React. I want to hear a lot of you. The first, um, first. Okay. The line. Yeah, the line that says, uh, uh, you do not want me to be happy, don't you? Yeah, you do want me to be happy, don't you? And and so the first line and the second line mixed together is actually showing the consequences, using the consequences of his buying the ring to insist on his buying it. Buy it so that I'll be happy. And that is appeal to threat. It's subtle, but it is there. What about appeal to the people? Please, you see appeal to the people there. <laughs> yeah, I don't Every husband, husband. Husband. Good job. The woman is like Eve in the Garden of Eden. <laughs> She's like Eve. Every good at the time. Did we say she should go and do that definition? And then the one that is a hasty generalization. Which, which part is a hasty generalization? Give me that ring. I will love you for life. Mm -hmm. oh, no, I'm looking for hasty generalization. You see why happy because he wants to become unhappy because the husbands refuse to buy them a round ring. You are all correct. I intentionally wanted all of you to speak like so from a course to say why and then the conclusion that wives. Which one my wife sitting here? <laughs> She's speaking to her Senate. <laughs> So she knows something about a course and sewa, and, and she's concluded wives become unhappy because there's another one implicit there. He said that uh, when when they they got their 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 rings, they have become happy. And so this is a multiply flawed reasoning. It has constipation. It lacks. It has anemia. It is infested with worms. The physician has a lot of work to do to make it a better reasoning. I am so done. Any questions? You will see that I didn't. This one we read it earlier. Okay, the secularity and equivocation. I didn't think that we should spend any extra time on this. Is it for those who may want to still remember being secular? This equivocation, you know it very well. You know secularity begging the question, the tissue principle. Okay, let me see if there is a final, very final question. The four hands. I currently wanted to read. So if you still have a question and you raise your hand, I'll see you very quickly, please. All right, I think we are done. If you are able to, and I, I will think that you should, then join the uh, in-person session on, on Saturday and Sunday. Pick any day for Saturday and Sunday. All those interactions will go on at New and Block. Please, I'm addressing January 2024, students main campus please for critical thinking don't go and play this in the future and then when you finish hearing the lecture then you go to new and block <laughs> that you heard it in the recording i'm addressing a specific class and i think you do also your exam discussion is on unit six seven nine ten okay madam. thank you I, yourself. I hope you also enjoyed yourself We'll get to see each other some someday on campus. For now, enjoy your, <laughs> your semester. I wish you well. All the best. All the best. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Yes, Madam. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, results. Oh, when we are done, we release it. There are short answer component that we must read. And we grade patiently and yeah. liberally. A review and review and review. When we do, we release it. For assignments one and two, some people had to, they qualified for a makeup because they were enrolled late, some for sports, some for something. Adapted. So when things are done, then we release all at once. That's how we do it. So you will get feedback shortly. Okay. By your, your MCQs, we have seen them already. Okay. Eight, okay. Over, 20, okay. over 20. Once in a while, I see two over 20. Oh, <laughs> okay, my okay, my <laughs> <laughs> okay. Bye -bye.
Bye bye, bye. 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 Thank you, madam. Bye. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Thank you, Jackson. Oh, thank you,